Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is Game 4 from the 2011 Women's World Chess Championship match. Going into this round, Hu Yi Fan has a 2-1 lead over Humpy Conroe and is looking to extend that lead playing with the white pieces. And so uh, let's see how things play out. We have e4, king pawn opening, and uh, Spanish game after a6, bishop back, knight f6, challenging that e4 pawn to which white just uh, continues with more development and black gobbles that pawn up. And now we, we enter an open Rue Lopez after d4, uh, b5, bishop b3, and now d5. It's important to not just run with something like e takes d, you're opening up the position, at, well black is opening up the position too early at this point, not uh, being certainly very underdeveloped. And we could see after something like d5, knight c3 is a very strong move. If uh, pawn takes knight, bishop takes pawn, this knight is caught in a crossfire hit by both Rook, bishop, caught in a pin, the knight is falling, maybe, and so too is the rook. And after maybe bishop to b7, knight to g5, additional fuel is being added to the knight. The queen is possibly coming out to that h5 square in some lines, and it's just going to be big trouble for black. So this is where things have to just come to a great halt, and black needs to focus on just development in, instead of running with pawn takes on d. And so instead we have d5, allowing this bishop to come out to that e6 square, advancing their development in other words. In which case now white follows up with the d takes e, bishop e6, development, lending support to d5, and now knight to d2. And uh, black says, uh, well, what is white doing? White's challenging the one piece in the white position, and black is uh, not a big fan of exchanging pieces and uh, essentially saying, you know, I'm going to make life difficult for your c1 bishop to come out and see things. So now we have a little bit of regrouping after c3, looking to maybe bring that bishop back to c2. We have more development on the black side, bishop e7 and bishop to c2. Um, now it's important to recognize that black does not really play this knight c5 move with the intention of giving itself up for that bishop. Uh, usually that is a good thing to obtain the bishop pair, but let's see why it's not maybe a good choice in this variation or in this particular position. If knight takes bishop, we have a case now where well, looking at the pawn structure, we have a four on three with regard to a king side advantage for the white side and a four, four on three queen side advantage for black. And so uh, both sides should be looking to get their pawns rolling. And it's not now going to be the easiest thing to do for the black side because of white's control over the c5 square. Already the knight is there and the bishop is going to conveniently place to the e3 square. Eventually exchanging out the dark square bishops means that this knight is going to f eventually pivot on that c5 square and say, uh, you know what, these pawns are not going to go nowhere. It's just going to keep all of them at bay. And so that's important to take into consideration. This is not going to be just uh, one of those things where you know a general principle of or, or something along the lines of, okay, the bishop pair is a very good thing. Uh, you, you do have to look a bit more deeply into the position, and right now c5 is a very critical square. So we don't have knight takes bishop, in other words. Instead, bishop e7 after bishop c2, d5. And uh, this is um, opening up that d5 square for the queen, the bishop, uh, looking to maybe isolate the, the white queenside structure and also play that d3 move, which could be quite annoying. We do see that in the game. After knight b3 is played, we have this uh, a fairly long-winded line right here. I think this is uh, something that black could be going with, uh, but I, I don't know that it really obtains an advantage. White, uh, after the smoke clears, is really going to be the one that's uh, able to be putting pressure on the black side. After d3, knight takes, pawn takes, bishop. Queen takes, rook takes, knight takes, bishop. And after pawn takes, we have this more simplified end game going on here where eventually this pawn is going to be gobbled back up and it's going to be a case of maybe this long term wise going to be a potential target. And if this pawn can't get rolling, it, you may very well see that C pawn being a potential target. So more development at this point, bishop e3, rook to d5, a nice rook lift targeting that e5 pawn. And now c4, which is a, very, a pretty interesting move here. What is it looking to do? It's looking to smash up uh, these, uh, this queenside structure for black. And uh, additionally, it's allowing for this knight to take up a nice residence on this c4 square. After black captures on c4, of course, uh, upon occupying a square does not mean it's controlling that particular square. So uh, at this point, just rook a to c1, this pawn is going to fall. 
Black tries to hang on to it for just a little bit, inducing some weaknesses such as a3 at this point. We do have knight takes a at, at this point right now. a3 kicks the knight away, rook takes c, and now king to d7. So it's important not to just run with castling because it's a simplified position. You want to keep your king centralized in this type of an endgame and get your rook active. King to, d, king to d7 does just that. Bishop to that d4 square, watching over e5, making it a little bit more difficult for black to just go ahead and grab that pawn. Additionally, it, wa it watches over that b2 pawn so that now rook takes c4 is a possibility. You really don't want to run with uh, this type of thing right now because we have an instance of white getting a not-so-healthy pawn and black gets a perfectly healthy pawn on the white side. So, uh, in other words, let's watch over b2 first. Black adds more fuel to it with rook to b8. Bishop tucks itself back, which is now allowing for this knight to reposition to that c4 square. And after c5, that's exactly what we have, knight d2, giving up this pawn right here and eventually knowing that c4 will then fall. Uh, now, that e5 pawn, I guess, was just going to be a bit overextended. There's not really going to be a great way to make progress unless you run with this type of variation. So you have to, you have to give, up, give something up in order to get something in return. And in this case, we're going to have an instance of a knight being really well placed on that c4 square in black really having to work around it. So knight d2, knight takes e, f4, chases this knight away from the defense of the pawn. After knight g4, knight takes on c4. This is an excellent uh, piece right here. It, it really cannot be uh, hit by any of the black rooks. It's watching over the b2 pawn and the d2 square, both of which are entry points for these rooks potentially. And uh, so at this point, bishop f6, that was, this is a case of getting uh, well, repositioning type of moves. What is this bishop really doing here? Not a whole lot. Let's get it doing something. And right now it has this d4 square in mind. After rook to e1, uh, half open file, that rook was not doing anything on the f file. Uh, on e1 it is doing something at least. Bishop d4, and well, there's not really going to be much choice at this point. White is just having to get rid of that bishop. Otherwise we either have knight takes on h2 or knight f2 type of moves. So it's intolerable, in other words, bishop takes bishop, rook takes, and now kick the knight away. h3, knight back, and knight to e5, landing a check. So this is, uh, how, how exactly to assess this position? Who is doing better exactly? Uh, well, just looking at the structure, I, I, it's definitely going to be the white side because these guys aren't so happy. Uh, three isolated pawns, or another way to view it is four pawn islands compared to just two on the white side. And uh, now this king is just kind of a bit, mm, it's a bit shaky. Uh, we do have this tricky piece that's finding itself in the black territory. And uh, we have a, a couple checks being thrown in here. And one reason for this is maybe to meet time control, just buying or just exhausting some moves towards that move 40. Um, we don't have at this point knight to e5. In fact, if knight to e5 is played again, black could go ahead and claim a threefold repetition draw. And so white is seeing better of this position and running with rook takes c and uh, getting, or excuse me, allowing that rook to just uh, recapture this pawn and get on the seventh rank. Now, at this point, and the knight throws another check in and then comes back, seeing how it's very important now to take into account there's already one rook placed on this second rank. Uh, black is looking to throw a second one on there. It's going to be big trouble for white unless they take uh, the necessary precautions. And uh, they're, they are running back with their knight at this point. Knight to f3, hitting the rook and watching over d2. That's the primary purpose. Um, after rook to e4, we have the exchange of rooks. And one might wonder why exactly uh, that is going on. Well, it's pretty much the case that if rook takes f, we have a case where this king is going to be maybe in some big trouble right here because we have we have two rooks you may very well see both of these white rooks now landing themselves on black seventh rank and the black king now being quite vulnerable and this rook maybe being a bit out of place uh, it's pretty much a case of three attacking pieces versus uh, this black king and um, it's it's going to th this is the best black piece but beyond that if there's not going to be additional pressure placed against g2 there's this really isn't doing a whole lot so, so as to just avoid any, any sort of crazy uh, combinations with three aggressive pieces attacking that black king, 
Black finds it best to exchange off one pair of rooks, and it starts to become at least a little bit more technical of a position. After the knight recaptures, we have rook to e5, forking the knight in pawn. Knight c3, rook takes, the king runs away, the a pawn is grabbed, and now this is passed, but is it going to be able to score a touchdown? We will see. After knight takes e, um, or knight to e2 with check, uh, knight takes on f, king g3, getting out of, uh, you really don't want to get caught back here if uh, the pawn were to push, we could have this, and we don't want to have that white king, in other words, cut off from the action. So it needs to just kind of get up there right now. J don't just run with, okay, this pawn is passed, let's get going with it. You need to take into account the king position, of course. So knight takes f, king g3, knight takes g2, and for the time being, this rook is now tethered to this knight, and it's going to need uh, a friend to come to its rescue, and uh, that friend is going to be this g5 pawn, because after rook to e6, where are the... Um, where are the escape squares for this knight? Everything is just watched over at this point by either the king or the rook. So we, we have this being taken into account right now, and this is going to have to be played h6 and then g5, so at least the knight has an outpost on f4, h4, probably f4 uh, of those two squares. So in any event, after knight to e5, we have rook to a2 getting behind that pass pawn. This is this is where uh, that black rook needs to be. You can't just allow this pawn to keep going. You need to get behind it. And, uh, well, there still is no time, uh, bear in mind, to make a knight move to either of these squares uh, because of uh, a knight check, and then that knight is just falling. So there's still no time to move the knight, in other words. So let's improve the rook position, rook a2. a4, there's no time to grab on a4. Again, the rook has uh, the primary purpose, watch over that knight g5 so finally this knight has outposts and well at the same time it, it creates an outpost for the knight but now it subjects this pawn to capture and that's what we have so after rook takes now the knight is able to just run away for the time being uh, rook, rook to f6 giving a check king g7 the rook gives another check and we have a case now where i believe black is uh much more, uh, well, realizing much more that this is going to turn out to be a draw because if there's one one pawn that the black king does not want to have to hunt down, uh, it's going to be what? It's going to be to run over and grab that uh, past a pawn. So it would much rather, in other words, have to deal with just this guy right here because there's no, there's no getting by the black king right here. Um, and so we have the game pretty much finishing up after h4. Some checks are being thrown in. And after knight d5, we have a, a nice lineup of the pieces right here. And there's really not going to be a whole lot of progress right here. This knight is very well positioned, keeping the king, um, you know, at bay. It, it has to be very cautious for where where it goes. It's uh, this knight in particular is watching over f6, so there's not going to be any checks against the black king. And this rook is maybe in some instances getting ready to just come behind that h pawn and pick it off but as as it plays out in this game we just kind of have a, a little bit of back and forth at this point the knight giving check king d2 knight back to d5 and after king to e4 we just have this game uh, coming down to a draw and uh, hu yi fan now with a two and a half point to one and a half point lead uh, going into round five so uh, we will see how that game plays out and uh, uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.